So, naturally, we have an absolutely classic gospel to work with. You know, the parable of the sower and the seed. Uh, You've heard it many times. So, just by way of introduction, um, I do not believe that a person is on one of those choices and one alone. All right, a human life is not just on the path or just in the weeds or just on good soil. We're a mix, all right? I, I think of the seed that's being sown as little, little tiny pieces of our soul scattered throughout life. Some opportunities are barren. It's on the path. The birds eat it up. Sometimes the weeds choke us. But if we're, if we're aware and mindful... We can cultivate that good earth where our faith and the faith of others can grow. All right? So I don't think it's absolute. You're not just on rocky soil or good soil and that's the end of it. No, we're constantly moving through life, seeking out that good soil. So all I want to do is just kind of illustrate how these, these different paths, these different places of the seed might seem. Um, for starters, on the path where the birds ate it up. You know, that's like desert. There is nothing there for the seed to even germinate, let alone take root. You know, it's basically bird seed at that point. And the person I think of there, his name was Marcus. Um, He was a professional body piercer. Uh, For the record, I have no piercings of any kind, okay? (laughs) Did not know him for that reason. He was a friend of a friend. But we were hanging out because, again, my friend knew him from some other thing. Um, We had a nice little talk. I was a first-year theologian in seminary, so I was starting to get a grip on my faith and take my possibility of priesthood seriously, and it was fine. It was fine. I went home, and the next day, my friend said, you know, Justin, you had a real effect on Marcus because you're the very first practicing Catholic he met and was able to respect. And I said, oh, that's a sweet compliment, and I went about my work. It, It didn't sink in until about a day later. I'm just sitting there, I'm like, the guy was in his late 20s or early 30s. And he lasted that long without meeting a single Catholic that was legitimately representing the faith. And that's kind of sad. It's, it's, you know, it's humbling when you're the one guy that actually breaks that pattern. But it was, it was scary to think that someone could go that long without meeting a single good Catholic. That is being on the path. Like, there is no soil. There is nothing good for the faith to take root. And he's a human being, so that seed of faith is in there somewhere. I I believe that for every single human being that has ever lived and ever will live. But he had nothing to grow it in. He had no one to teach him about Christ, at least by way of Catholicism. So that's the path. Um, Moving on to rocky soil, I just want to share a quick story about my brother. Because, you know, my brother, uh, his name is Eric. Uh, He's six years younger than me. Um, He's the loved son. (laughs) I'm the son that stayed out of trouble. We had a good dichotomy there. Um, So my brother, um, he's he's proud to be Christian. He is proud to be Catholic. Um, He doesn't go to church quite as often as me. He doesn't go to church as often as as we're supposed to. Um, But he, he he is Catholic. Um, and one day in the early 2000s, 2005 at the absolute latest, he did something that he had never done before. He asked me to have a one-on-one Bible study with him. And it was because he had recently read a book called The Da Vinci Code. So for those of you that don't recall entirely, The Da Vinci Code is an absolutely fictional crime thriller. It is a fine book. It is well written. It is exciting. I have read it and I enjoyed it. It is actually relatively typical of any other crime drama. Um, If you read those kind of books, I think you'll agree with me, it's fairly typical. However, when it came out, it was expertly advertised because they advertised this book that if you read this book, you will have a new advantage in understanding the real meaning of the Bible as was rediscovered by Leonardo da Vinci. It's total, total hogwash. But people of all ages ate it up. And there was this frenzy of, 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 of biblical appreciation through the da Vinci Code. 
And my brother was one person that kind of got in on that fad. And sure enough, weeks or months later, I forgot how much time it actually took, it was abundantly clear that this guy had no understanding of the Bible beyond, beyond the, the, the typical way, and it was pure fiction and all that. And I can't tell you what my brother was thinking, because I don't know. But I do have reason to believe that my brother was hurt and frustrated by way of betrayal. He, he put his faith in something that was unworthy of his trust. And I think that had a profound negative effect on him. And uh, he has never asked me to join him for a Bible study again. Um, but like I said, you know, he did get married in the church. We had a fine wedding and all that uh, at the Church of the Jesu, so it's all good. But that's what, that's what rocky soil is. It's, it's soil where it's easy to get going but hard to continue. And the solution to that, just like in gardening, is you transplant the plant and put it in better soil. And that brings me to the good soil, of course. What is the good soil? I was thinking, because you know, I took a look at the readings a week ago before I left for mission trip, and I, I kind of figured that I wouldn't talk about mission trip today. I'd save that for another time. But yesterday, as I was trying to get my act together, I'm just sitting there at Dublin's, eating my, uh, my, my Parmesan eggplant sandwich, 10.99, chips or, uh, or fries. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like passing out coupons as I said that part. Um, I was thinking, and I just, I, I decided I couldn't talk about anything else. I've got to talk about Good Earth as in the mission trip. Because we went there, and you know, it's, it's a week, and they're long days. You wake up at 6.15, lights out at 11 o'clock. You are moving. I want to say there were about three hours of free time scattered throughout the day. But the thing is, your, your literal work, you know, painting the fence or whatever, well, you're only at your work site for six hours a day and you get a full hour for lunch. My point being, when you go on mission trip, you're not spending 90% of your time in the blistering heat nailing stuff to a, to a porch. The work is about one third of your time. The other time, you are in community, you're having lunch with your, your, your people, you're, you're socializing, you're hearing talks, there's, there's music and dancing, and it's the entire effect together. That's what makes it good earth. Because, you know, I'm an adult now, apparently, and I'm sitting there, and I'm watching all of this as something of an outsider. You know, I am not a teenager. I am not a young adult anymore. The mission trip is not for me. I am a chaperone. But as I'm watching this, I'm watching 250 people celebrating themselves and one another, God bless them, taking their faith seriously. This was a Catholic mission trip, so there was mass every day. And they were making the world a better place by their own two hands. And it was that combination of everything coming together that made it good earth. And I'm telling you that faith was blossoming during this week, at least for some people. I can't promise 100%, of course, but it was an amazing week. So I'm going to shift my focus now mainly to you adults because I've been here for about 13 months now. I feel like I know you better. Not, not perfectly, of course. Perfect is a strong word. But I mean, I did the math. Statistically, we've celebrated over 400 Masses together. I feel like I've heard that many confessions. Maybe not, I don't know. But I know you, I know what makes you tick. And I know you worry. I know you worry about your family, you worry about your parish, you worry about your town, you worry about the church, and you worry about the world. You know something's wrong, and I know that you know that something's got to improve. And what I'm telling you here today is that it's not going to happen without you, okay? Because you are the provider of that good soil. It has to start with you guys. And you know what? I'm sorry. I got to do it. I got to assign you homework. I'm a grumpy old priest, and that is just what we do. Kids, don't worry. This is only adults', adults homework. Here it is. If you are an adult... And if your kids, if you have not passed on the faith to your kids with the amount of success you were hoping for, I really want you to think seriously tonight about signing up for a mission trip chaperone position in 2018 or to become a catechist for our religious education program, okay? 
because no matter what happened with your family, I have no idea. I'm not telling you you're bad parents or failures. I know that happens. You tried your best. It happens. But I am here to tell you that you are not done. You are not done passing on the faith to the next generation. There is work to be be done. There are youth who need you. And like any other parish, we have a very easy time getting kids for mission trip, but not adult chaperones, and we always need teachers because it's intimidating. It's intimidating to teach. I get that. It is worth it. And they need you. Even if your biological children don't need you as much anymore, or if you didn't have the success you were hoping for with your family, there are still people who need you. And there is still opportunity all around you to join in our community of faith and pass on that good earth to those who need it the most. That is your homework, adults, to think about how you can be that good earth for the faith of another. And whether or not that applies to you, remember, we are always called to seek out that good earth where our faith can grow and thrive. And when we're not in good earth, all it takes is a change. So as long as we keep our eye out for it.